There is a very, very high degree of confidence by the people who study this issue in the government and who have studied it previously. And I say in the past 10 years, so more recent study, uh, that some of these objects are neither uh, the US nor some you know, brainiac like Elon Musk, uh, nor China, Russia, uh, Israel, because the performance characteristics are so extraordinary compared to both what we have in research and development and obviously what we have out. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I've got a really interesting guest and, and a, a little bit of an out there topic today to talk everything UFOs. Uh, joining us to, to discuss that issue is Tom Rogan, my pal and a, a writer and editor at The Washington Examiner. Tom, thanks for joining the show. Good to be with you, Brad. So you cover national security, the military, foreign policy, lots of stuff. You've, you've got sources in Washington. I know I, I always enjoy reading your work, but one of your pet issues is, is the issue of UFOs, which people think and they just hear um, aliens and they think sci-fi, but it's actually a real thing and a real issue. And, and I'm, I want to break it down. Just to start, can you define what a UFO is? Yeah, so, you know, the basic definition is an unidentified flying object, but the US government and the military in particular refer to UFOs as UAPs, uh, which is unidentified aerial phenomena. Uh, basically, those those two terms are interchangeable, um, but I think it reflects actually in an interesting way the government's desire to, to take this seriously. They felt that they had to give it a different name because of some of the stigma that surrounds UFOs uh, in that way that that perhaps you just suggested. Yeah, and and how do we know they're real or not just you know myth or science fiction? Yeah, no, that that's a really important question, and and so a number of ways, right? That that some are not are not real, right? Some are the vast majority of UFOs are either weather phenomena, um, you know, in some cases it can be astronomical. Uh, phenomena, um, people misidentifying, you know, a balloon or a plane, um, someone just simply, you know, uh, making a mistake in terms of an observation. But the ones that are most compelling that drive the the military's research of this subject, uh, and I guess the, the kind of, you know, escalating public discourse, um, we know they're real because of data, uh, sensor recordings. When I say sensor, I mean things like radar, uh, sonar, um, satellite imagery, uh, satellite measurement in, uh, data, which is sort of, you know, essentially measuring how quickly something is moving uh, from point A to point B, or, or, or in UFO cases, uh, lots of different points. Um, you know, infrared electromagnetic spectrum analysis, so things moving in terms of light distortion or activity. And when you match up situations where you have a pilot, you know, who's flying. Again, a lot of the pilots you've seen more recently are, are fighter pilots uh, in the U.S. Navy flying off aircraft carriers uh, in the training areas of the east and west coasts where uh, essentially aircraft carrier crews uh, and their escorts prepare to deploy. Um, you know, what we are seeing is pilots saying, I saw this thing. Uh, and that pilot isn't just like you and me, right? That pilot has gone through very intensive training so that they know in the event of a conflict or an intercept of you know an, another aircraft, even if their radar systems are not working, they're being jammed, for example, they can identify through their vision. That's, here's what I'm looking for to, to make it. So they're called trained observers. So they're also psychologically, right? We don't put people in charge of uh, you know $80 million warplanes with lethal weapons. We don't put people in there who are, uh, mentally unwell uh, because of the obvious risk that they might decide, you know, I'm going to go and blow up my friend's house or, you know, Times Square instead of, you know, protect the country. So so that military observer point is really critical. And then matching up with that radar. So with again, with the aircraft carriers, they'll have what's called the Aegis cruisers, which is very, very advanced radar, essentially, you know, track a, a baseball up to, a, you know, dozens of miles away. Um, and sonar from the submarines and destroyers, you know, monitoring what's going on under the water. And when you have a pilot saying, I'm seeing this, or a radar operator saying, go here because we're seeing this on our screen. And then the pilot gets there and says, hey, I'm seeing this. And you've had that, that you know, essentially that combination of different data sources matching up. Then you know something's going on. 
And when it keeps happening with different people and different ships and radar systems, mm -hmm. uh, then something is going on. And, and the, the characteristics bear similarity in some cases, uh, although there are different forms and behavior patterns that are associated with these most compelling UFOs. So I, let me ask you about that. Are we talking about dozens or a handful or hundreds of sightings in recent years? Just how common is this phenomenon? Well, we are talking, I think, in, in the average year, you know, in, and sightings have been escalating for whatever reason. Um, but we are talking, I would say, more than a dozen, although some of those incidents can be just different pilots and different returns of, you know, multiple objects in the same time and space. Um, but really, this is something, you know, since the, the notable or the more notable Nimitz 2004 incident, which involved a, an object that looked like a Tic Tac, quite frankly, a lot of them, um, but really one of them was sort of seen visually. Um, you know, there have been hundreds of sightings. Um, and, and so these most compelling ones, there are enough to develop trend lines uh, in terms of the performance. Um, in terms of the, where they appear, they tend to appear more often uh, around nuclear sites, uh, whether that's aircraft carriers, nuclear reactors, or land-based nuclear sites, especially military ones. And, and really, if you go back through the Freedom of Information Act uh, records back to really the Manhattan Project, there's a lot of saturation of sightings around nuclear sites, you know, going back many decades. Um, so that's one thing. And then in terms of the performance of these objects, uh, the ability to do instantaneous hypersonic acceleration, so that's going thousands of miles an hour from a stop, um, to do that without jet propulsion. We don't understand how something without wings or without jet fuel would be able to do these things uh, in terms of our understanding of avionics. Um, and in terms of the data recordings, uh, you know, when radar hits these things um, and sonar, you know, they are uh, identified to be objects and the pilots as well saying that, you know, um, with some of them, there is a transparency component, but a lot of them are solid. Uh, I also know, uh, although, you know, I'm, it's something, I mean, the source is exceptional for it, um, but perhaps it's, it's something I maybe hold back a little bit. I, I am very confident the U.S. government has materials as well from uh, craft that have either crashed. I don't know the situation with that, but I am extremely confident they do have materials from different craft um, or, or just wreckage, whatever, but stuff, you know. And so, so there's part of the analysis of what these things are is rooted in that. And I think we will learn more about that, actually, uh, in the coming years. Um, I don't think they have little green men in the basement somewhere or, or a flying saucer. Um, but yeah, so hypersonic acceleration. Uh, the challenge with that as well is not just the avionics in terms of, um, you know, thrust uh, and lift, but also in terms of uh, G-forces. Uh, the way these things will behave in terms of going stop to start and stop um, produce, would produce hundreds of G-forces. Uh, and so, or does produce hundreds of G-forces uh, in terms of our understanding of physics. Um, and, you know, would be impossible, as we understand it, for a biological, you know, for, for a person to be in there, unless you start getting into sort of theoretical physics in terms of other areas, space-time metric. But again, we're too, that's too, we're not there yet. I mean, the Pentagon maybe is looking at that and have been looking at that with some of the declassified reports that have come out, but um, I'm not a theoretical physicist. Um, hundreds of knots under the water also, which is really extraordinary in terms of friction. Uh, that we would expect um, and then the ability uh, to um, you know essentially be uh, undetected it's if, if desired and so they will jump in and out of radar contact uh, can jam uh, avionics in terms of aircraft that are following them a declassified British Ministry of Defense report and, and I've heard it corroborated from other sources uh, says that in the Cold War the Soviet Air Force Soviet Union attempted to engage these UFOs at points and lost aircraft doing so. Um, so th there's a lot out there. And, and I think, you know, probably for the new, the person just getting involved with the subject, it's easy to say, this is, this is too crazy. And if, it, if this is happening, how, how have I not heard about it? How, why is there not more uh, video? Um, again, I think we are at a revolutionary moment, though, in this. Yeah, myself and another Report, I would say probably the best reporter in the world on this subject, a guy called Tim McMillan, 
Um, we both reported uh, last year uh, of a 2019 incident where an F-18 crew was flying uh, and off the East Coast and a triangle shaped UFO with three white lights on the periphery, you know, on the peripheral points uh, rose out of the water, equilateral triangle and zoomed up straight up. Um, triangles are one of the forms that have been commonly reported uh, over the decades. But again, you know, what is that? Um, we don't know. I, I, and I think that's the important point. I do wonder, because I know you know this, I just came back from a vacation, and I, I kind of missed a bunch of news cycles, but why are UFOs coming up again in the news now? Well, I, I think uh, that the top line is that next month in June, there is supposed to be the provision of a report by the Director of National Intelligence, uh, which is the superseding authority uh, for all the various intelligence agencies in the US government, uh, on UAPs or UFOs. And that was requested by Marco Rubio when he was the chairman, obviously with Republicans losing the Senate majority, he's now the vice chairman. Um, but that report is due next month. Uh, and there is a specific request that there be a public unclassified portion to that report. And so with that happening, uh, and with some more recent footage that has come out of an incident uh, off the California coast, involving numerous warships seeing what looked like pyramid type objects um, dancing around the skies near them. You know, I think the media attention is sort of escalating. I also think, and, and this is important to be aware of, right? That because of the um, ramifications of the subject prospectively, uh, there is a, a lot of interest in terms of uh, readership. You know, this is stuff that you've got to be careful on and you've got to be well sourced on, I think, because otherwise there is an incentive to go too far with the subject where, where you can't go yet with the data. Uh, and, uh, you know, also to sort of get into the impulse of just writing something for clicks, uh, because people, it, it will get clicks. Um, and so I, 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 you know, try and try and be uh, careful uh, with with what I'm saying, because, you, you know, you don't want to just be doing something just because, you know, people are going to, um, you know, enjoy reading it. Yeah. And that's why I, I have appreciated your writing in the past is it's sporadic. It's when there's actually something newsworthy going on and your work is concentrated in these national security issues. Uh, so you're not a Buzzfeed article about the latest UFO sighting. Uh, well, and, and thank I you. Guess, yeah. I guess I'll ask um, one of the things that often comes up is how do we know, or do we know, that these um, UFOs and these objects and these aircraft um, aren't China or Russia or some other foreign nation that we're unaware of? Yeah, so we are uh, highly confident, the US government is highly confident. They don't want to put this, I do not know if it is explicitly in uh, the briefing slides that have been produced. There is a brief, a top secret briefing on this subject that is given, for example, to the members of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, uh, and certain others, the president, President Trump received it, and President Biden either will have received it or will soon. Um, I don't know if in that report, I have not seen that explicitly. I know the basic parameters of what is in there, um, but there is a very, very high degree of confidence by the people who study this issue in the government and who have studied it previously. And I say in the past 10 years, so more recent study, uh, that some of these objects are neither uh, the US nor some you know brainiac like Elon Musk uh, nor China Russia uh, Israel because the performance characteristics are so extraordinary compared to both what we have in research and development and obviously what we have out currently flying around of what, that we have made uh, but also what our best intelligence suggests are um, you know most the most competitive technological nations around the world have. So again, that would be China, Russia, Israel, for example. They do not have things uh, that show uh, really any of the characteristics that delineate these against traditional airframes. Uh, and so it is seen as highly unlikely. Also the behavior patterns uh, are, uh, you know, don't comport with, I mean, the real thing is the technology differential, but, but the behavior patterns do not comport with what we, would uh, expect either from a secret, you know, US government, you know, the CIA out at Area 51, although CIA is not really out there, uh, or 
uh, the Chinese or Russians. Uh, as an example of that, some of these have come very close to hitting um, US aircraft in 2015. Uh, what one of the pilots described as a um, sphere in, encased in a cube, or it might actually be the inverse of that, but essentially one of these objects coming between uh, two planes that were flying in very close formation. You know, again, if you're testing new technology, red teaming, what it is called, which we do do, right, that we want to see how our best people react to something unknown sometimes, um, there are specific rules about that because you don't want someone to die. Um, and 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 you will do it in certain areas, and the admiral will be briefed on it uh, because again, that there, there, there has to be a level of accountability. Um, you know, jumping out of essentially um, popping up on radar, you know, eighty thousand feet, or coming out from under the water out of nowhere. You know, again, we this is not um, you know something that 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 would you know comport with that and it's also if the chinese and russians have this it is their stuff you know they've had it for decades that's point one and if we look at uh their geopolitical ambitions uh you would expect them at least to be displaying this in in, in a more overt manner so as to create the political effect right that the, the military force in its ultimate essence is a continuation of politics by other means as klaus Schwitz said uh they are not using these things if they have them and that's because, frankly, they don't have them. And of course, if they don't have them, if we don't have them, and they do appear to be intelligently controlled, should have mentioned that before, actually, that's a delineator. They will, um, there is pretty good evidence to suggest they are at least monitoring radio communication between uh, pilots uh, and, say, the aircraft carrier, uh, because of where they, they will put in 2004, this Tic Tac object. Uh, went to what was called the rally point or the uh, the next part of a combat air patrol before the pilots um, were actually going there. And so it, it, it either knew what the pilots were thinking or it knew the communication. Um, and, and there are incidents like that. So there's an intelligent control dimension to this, uh, which is obviously compelling. Um, but again, that, that fact that it's not us, what is it? is the yeah. you know the, the top line uh, of interest um i think for, for the subject so if it's not a foreign government most likely i mean what are the, the theories is it is it aliens it sounds kind of extreme but i mean is, is that what it has to be extraterrestrial or are there other theories that could explain it other than that yeah so so i would say um that, that you know some of these so i mentioned the the 2019 incidents with sort of the pyramids flying off the ships you know um some of the ph photographs that i have seen um you know do look like they could be balloons right so again that goes back to that point i said at the beginning that some of this is not going to be extraordinary um but the extraordinary stuff that you know has gone through all the analysis i think the top line uh assessments really behind the scenes and you can see because of the political dimension to this why they would be reluctant to officially say that are it's either extraterrestrial so aliens extra dimensional so you know essentially from an, an, an area of subspace or something beyond our understanding of um you know how the physical environment is shaped uh, or something uh that has been uh here for a very long time uh that exists separate and distinct to um you know uh governments, corporations, whatever, the, the, the traditional kind of earth as we know it in terms of uh, the human experience. Uh, so those are the really, the, I think, the three top things. There is kind of more peripheral ideas, you know, time travel, et cetera. I think the data um, is less good on that. And there is data, um, you know, to suggest um, that some of these things, how they operate, for example, when you, you know, and I'm trying to sort of work on more of that. A lot of that gets into very classified areas not so much because of what the data says, but because of how we have collected it, right? We don't want Russia and China to know how good we are at detecting their aircraft at very long range or their submarines uh, or their nuclear forces, um, uh, you know, or their communications. And so a lot of the platforms that are collecting us, satellites, for example, uh, uh, are some very, very tightly held capabilities on the part of the US military. Um, but, you know, th there will be more to come on that. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess that makes me wonder how forthcoming has the U.S. government been with this stuff? I know you mentioned this uh, report that will come out soon enough 
supposedly, but in the past, have they kind of covered this up? There's there's no question uh, that there has been uh, a, a cover up. Um, it, the nature of the cover up is in question, though. I, I I think there have been elements of the government that have concealed incidents. That that is quite clear, uh, and have written them off as you know always. It's always a weather. The NSA, for example, a lot of their FOIA reports describes weather balloons, um, and. You know, so the Air Force, Army Air Force going back really to the late 40s, some of the sightings, um, they knew that there was a nuclear connection, which they played down. Uh, and again, we do have pretty good material now from Freedom of Information uh, Act stuff. Um, but really, I think there has been a, um, you know, a, quite frankly, a, a lack of interest in addressing the subject. Um, because of how complicated and um, potentially how um, socially destabilizing it would be. Certainly that was the big concern, I think, um, following the, the Second World War, where you saw the spike in the, really the late 40s of the you know, flying saucers being the traditional form there, including again by military observers, not just lots of civilians, um, that in a country that then was obviously still um, you know, very religious and um, you know, in, imbued with certain cultural values that this perhaps might represent a paradigm shift that would be a destabilizing in the environment at the beginning of an, uh, what was seen as an existential struggle with the Soviet Union, the Cold War. Um, there was also traditionally been and still is an issue with elements uh, within the military believing uh, that the that, that subject um, has religious connotations more than technological ones. And so, for example, uh, the Air Force uh, has a reputation behind the scenes uh, for uh, senior officers pushing the subject away in the past because they said it potentially could be demonic. That is not to say that it's all Air Force officers, but some very senior ones have done that. And you, Louis, Luis Elizondo, uh, who headed up the Pentagon's program, um, under the Obama administration and the beginning of President Trump's administration, um, you know, it has explicitly said that, and other people have told me the same. The Navy is seen as much better traditionally as, as being willing to sort of theorize that. And, and in a way, that's good because one of the leading elements of investigating this, or the leading element as we understand it, is from the Office of Naval Intelligence. Um, so. So what would, just just playing the theory out, what would the point of the UFOs be if they're extraterrestrial or they're uh, controlled by some sort of alien life? And does that play into the nuclear part? Are they, are they trying to keep, would they be trying to keep tabs on nuclear weapons or, or what, do you, what are the theories here for the goal of these objects? We don't know. Uh, I, I think that's a very good. I mean, you hit the nail on the head with the nuclear. There's a book that I think will become, should become already. I mean, certainly the people in the government now, you know, the government effort to understand this is ramping up. It's sort of required reading. It's a book uh, written by a friend of mine called Robert, uh, called UFOs and Nukes, uh, written by Robert Hastings. And Robert just spent essentially decades talking to um, military personnel who'd worked at various nuclear weapon sites in the United States and um, and some places abroad in terms of their experience of seeing things. Um, you know, and, and some of those situations also happened in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, UFOs were sighted coming over nuclear weapon sites, um, either hovering there in some cases, witnesses. And again, you do not get to be you know, manning nuclear weapon sites in the Cold War if you're crazy, right? That that takes a lot of psychological testing, right? You want someone who knows who's who's playing with a full deck. Uh, and these people are saying, you know, some of the cases, a light comes down from the thing and the nuclear weapons start not turning off and on. Uh, not about to blow up, but turning off and on or won't respond to user control, right? That you always have the ability to test. Is it working effectively in case you need to launch? And that happened in the Soviet Union as well. What's the intent behind that? If that happened, I, I believe it, it did because of the quality of those witnesses, um, the fact that it ha there have been sustained sightings corroborated in some cases by radar at these sites. If that happened, what is the intent? Is it to say, don't play with fire? Uh, is it to say something else? We don't know. I, I, I do. I think because of the... Uh, uh, 
the indications here of intelligent, strong indications of intelligent control and high capability. I, I think it's one fortunate thing is there does not appear to be an explicit threat vector uh, in the sense that we do not have uh, very good evidence, to, apart from very limited scenarios where it tends to be more jamming um, of uh, a threat intent here. Uh, it seems to be more uh, yeah. curiosity um, and monitoring. And I think that's all we could really say. I mean, again, this that that intent though is something we want to get to the bottom of because whatever this is, it acts with impunity against the very best of what we have. Um, and so, you know, we should want to know um, what it is, right? And 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 if, and also whether it's more than one thing, right? That's important to to know is that you know there are different. Um, shape things and they behave in different ways um so maybe it's more than one thing yeah I, I was wondering that whether people should be worried or scared about this to some extent because if somebody has this technology i mean if they if they wanted to i would assume that that means they could vastly overpower uh what our governments have to protect us from it but it doesn't seem like that's really a concern no, uh, uh, one concern though that does um, that that I think really should motivate people to say uh, because there are some people that for whatever reason they they believe just leave this alone we shouldn't deal with it. I would say the ultimate um, riposte to that argument is we have a we're going to have a major problem if China or Russia figures out how these things work and can replicate them. If that happens. Um, number one, they have nuclear dominance. We are, they can because these things can detect all of our nuclear platforms, whether they're under sea, in a bunker, wherever. So you know, if you can do that and you can appear like that and do something against them, they could launch a nuclear strike without any deterrence. Um, in terms of the overmatch in, in all of the technology that you know I've talked about, again, we don't want the Russians or Chinese to be able to figure out any of this, and so far they haven't been able to. Um, but the only way to sort of mitigate against that is to study it ourselves. Uh, I do think, though, on the flip side, and we do know, I, you know, I, I don't know about the Chinese. I do know that the, the Russians from the Cold War uh, to the current day continue to resource investigations explicitly of this UFO phenomena, partly for that reason. And the U.S. government knows they are doing that. So I think that is one reason the Intelligence Committee, for example, being briefed on this. Um, and, and your listeners should actually go on TMZ, to their credit, actually, did an interview, street interview with Martin Heinrich, uh, Senator Heinrich on, um, you know, near the Capitol complex this week. And I, I think he made some of the most explicit kind of statements in terms of being one of the people who's received that top level briefing, you know, saying why he doesn't think it's China or Russia, but, but it sort of hints at that security component. I would say on the more positive side, Knowing that these things are machines, uh, that they have these extraordinary capabilities, um, we should be uh, inspired into the possibilities of science there. You know, it just is a basic point, right? The way these things move, if we were able to replicate that, you know, our understanding of energy, we talk about climate change, for example, we wouldn't need to burn fuels. Um, we could get, you know, could go to have lunch in Paris, not in 30 minutes, but, you know, five or six minutes maybe maybe less i don't know um you know that there are manifest opportunities here uh to to advance uh our understanding of um uh, of, you know our use of technology in society on that positive note is is a good place to leave it if people want to know more i will drop the link to some of your articles about this subject in the show notes but tom before we go i know you're a brit right you came you right. came here from the uk well dual citizen Dual citizen. Okay, Dual citizen. that's good to know. But yeah. um, you must have some interesting food takes about American food and life. So, so hit us with them. Well, yeah, and British food is uh, like our teeth is, is not uh, renowned for uh, its uh, beauty. Um, but thank goodness we have the accent in that case. Although my teeth, I think the only really I got the prominent canines, but apart from that, I think I'm doing okay. Um, so you know, one of the things I love about the US is the the um, ability to get pretty good quality food at, at you know, restaurants um, across the price range, right? That you, it is the living standards in the United States, I think, are superior to Europe, um, you know, in the sense that you can go out, you, if you want to go to Olive Garden, 
or you want to go to Le Diplomat, you've got range there. Same with vacations, affordability. affordability. So I love that. Um, you know, I love American food, burgers. Uh, I would say my favorite food in the world is probably, um, you know, going to be Thai beef salad, which is an odd thing, but my mother used to make very good Thai beef salad. That's sort of marinated, um, you know, quality steak, and they just have sort of a kind of, you know, Asian fusion salad. Um, in DC, I like escargot uh, at Le, Le Diplomat, and I know that I makes like me sound like the perfect kind of point of hatred for everyone in America to think, look at this, you know, liberal British accented person going to Le Diplomat for escargot. But I, I do just kind of, it's like little garlic butter nuggets. Um, yeah, like garlic butter chicken nuggets that aren't chicken, so yeah. That are literally I mean, snails, but ugh, right. sounds gross, but enjoy. All right, Thank Tom, you, sir. thanks so much for coming on. Thank you.